Well, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for coming back to listen to another episode. I really appreciate your support and your interest in this podcast. I would love to hear from anybody who wants to provide feedback or just make a comment about a certain episode or series as a whole. If you have an idea for an episode or you have someone in mind that you think would be willing to share something really valuable please share it with me. There are a few ways that you can get in contact with me. You can visit my website, www.mindyourbodydmt.com. And I also now have a Facebook page dedicated to this podcast. And that is the same name as this podcast. So search Mind Your Body, a dance movement therapy perspective, and you should be able to find it. It's quite new, but I'm hoping to regularly update with upcoming episodes and episode summaries and at some point putting out related resources and a space for you to share your ideas and comments as well. All right. So on to the episode. We have Antonia Arbolita Hanneman, who's a psychologist and board certified dance movement therapist living and working in Germany. This was an amazing interview. I learned so much from Antonia sharing how she's been using and implementing dance movement therapy in both in therapeutic sessions and in the actual airplane. And Antonia has done over 140 seminars since 2003 from people suffering from aviophobia. That's phobia flying. And there's just a lot of interesting information in here. It's really good. So here we go. Enjoy it. This is Mind Your Body, a dance movement therapy perspective on the integration of our emotional, cognitive, physical, and spiritual aspects of our being into one more aware and whole existence. Hi, Ulrich. This is Antonia. Hi, how are you? Thank you for the opportunity, by the way. I'm very honored to do that. Oh, yeah, no problem. When I was talking to Christina Devereaux, I told her about this project. And she's like, I know a woman who does this amazing work who works with flying phobias. I've never heard of that before. And I was like, wow, really? It's weird. (laughs) It's really weird. I have never heard of anyone with that kind of focus. And so I was very curious and very intrigued. And I, yeah, I'm curious about how you came to specialize in using dance movement therapy for people who are struggling with flying phobias. Well, being a dance movement therapist, here's the quick answer. I couldn't help it. I had to use movement. Um, But if you want the longer, more elaborate answer, it would start with me being introduced to working with individuals and groups with aviophobia. So that's fear of flying and fear of flying seminars. A colleague of mine invited me to join her on a team of around 11 psychologists who have been leading the seminars very successfully through flugangst.de. This is like the website, the agency in Munich, in direct cooperation with the German Lufthansa for over 30 years now. And I have been part of the team 14, since 14 years. The fear of flying seminars that originally followed a strict behavioral approach included some relaxation technique, but completely missed the implementation of movement. So when I first attended a seminar in order to acquaint myself with the course of an entire weekend, I not only had the chance to learn phobia-oriented therapeutic techniques, but also could observe, sense, and get an understanding of the individuals attending the seminar. When clients share their experiences and their fears related to flying sitting in a circle, I learned that the typical client who suffers from aviophobia is sitting in an airplane, holding his breath or hyperventilating, tightening every available muscle, squeezing the armrest, focusing on obsessive compulsive thoughts and magical beliefs, or even going out of their mind, leaving their body in a panic attack. That's what they all shared in a group. It seemed more than logical to work on reconnecting the lost and absent mind with the suffering, non-breathing, non-moving body in order to recreate a functioning and healthy mind-body connection. So when I was listening to the clients sitting in the group attending the first seminar, I already felt my own personal inner urge to move, to breathe, to expand and let go of muscle tension that I took over 
part of a somatic transference experience. So the sensation flows throughout my every seminar over the past 14 years as a kind of somatic transference, getting attuned to my clients, both in individual or group sessions, being a container for their fears, for their anxieties, concerns, and tensions. So what I do is I follow my inner need to move and transform fear into movement, if not being able to reach the mind with rational, logical arguments or technical facts. So if they would believe in statistics, they wouldn't come to the seminars all, all along. So one way to reach the mind can be through movement. Having experienced a loss of control or having gone through a traumatic situation, clients can find movement and dance being an incredible, valuable, and powerful tool to regain the sense of control that they are missing. So by using movement and dance, I assist them to recreate their individual connection of body and mind, and therefore a sense of cohesive self. That's what I experience and what I can observe and I really learned over the time doing the seminars. So applying relaxation and breathing techniques, providing methods to reduce stress, muscular tension, and other symptoms of hyperarousal, experiencing oneself and one's inner strength and joy of life through dance and movement enables all the clients and individuals to reconnect their body and mind and finally move on. I've implemented and constantly refined the application of dance and movement, I think in over for, I don't know, 144 fear flying seminars about that mm. over the last 14 years. So it has been like 10 seminars at least a year, once once a month, generally. Mm -hmm. Wow. Who are your clients and how do they decide to work with you versus going to a different approach of psychotherapy? Yeah, well, the thing is, people always think that clients who suffer from aviophobia might be people with a certain disease or a special disorder, but actually it's something that is very common in people. So individuals come from various backgrounds, ranging in age from early adolescence to older adulthood. My youngest client was 11, I think. My oldest, 82, last year, a lady was 82, so <laughs> she joined us, <laughs> it was great. People come from different educational backgrounds and professions. Some have therapeutic experience, some have never been to a therapist in their entire life. So it's a huge and wide range of clients. They also come with very individual histories regarding the origin of their particular fear of flying. Just to make some examples, I remember um, having as a client a traumatized fireworker who developed severe claustrophobia after having been trapped in a pipe. So after he was rescued, he projected his trauma onto every confined space and therefore, of course, developed also a fear of flying, so he wouldn't enter a plane anymore. Um, a mother who has been traumatized in an emergency landing when evacuating passengers were almost stomping on her child in panic, so she never wanted to enter an aircraft again. But then after several years, she wanted to travel again with her family, so she came to one of my seminars. I also had several clients who experienced 9-11 in one or another way that, of course, left them in a deep trauma. So, for instance, one young woman who was actually flying out of New York back to Germany right after the second plane hit the towers. So she, of course, was deeply scared. But being young and longing to travel the world, she eventually decided to process her fear of flying and came to my seminar. Or a businessman who traveled all his working life and all of a sudden probably coming from a burnout syndrome, he experienced a panic attack so that he couldn't enter the aircraft anymore. So in general, the yeah. only thing my clients definitely have in common is that they are all afraid of something. Anxiety in its complexity of symptoms, levels of arousal, consequential behavior, its causes and individual origin, as well as the very particular coping strategy of each client is the common ground on which my work starts. Every time similar, every time so very different. So you can basically find... I would say four categories of aviophobia, the typical ones that might overlap in causes and indications, but are very individual regarding onset, cause, and outcome. I would say the first category just describes people who have associated phobias as claustrophobia, acrophobia, which is the fear of heights, not going on towers or crossing bridges, not able to take the normal route to work since it either goes through the channel or over a bridge, which is the typical um, situation here in Hamburg obsessive fear of losing control or dying. Some people are really obsessing on dying and, mm. and how to die and how it feels like and such things. 
Um, so people whose life situation has precipitated aviophobia are related to the second category of fearful flyers who develop their fear after having experienced incidents like, um, I don't know, separation or divorce, loss of a job, environmental stress, burnout syndrome, or even severe illness or the death of a loved one. I often find that um, especially women, when having a child during pregnancy or postpartum after giving birth, but also men when becoming a parent, tend to display an increase of anxiety, develop fear of separation or fear of dying. Mm -hmm. Those clients then do either not want to fly with their family, but rather fly alone, because if they die in a plane crash, their family would still be alive, or they only want to fly with their entire family, because then they would at least die altogether. <laughs> This gives give you an insight into typical thoughts some of my clients are dealing with. Believe me, it sounds funnier than it is. <laughs> no, that actually sounds really, I, I think that kind of sounds normal, you know. And <laughs> to it, it you, you're like, what? So you would fly alone, family alone, but no, you would fly with your own uh, entire family. So I bet a lot of people listening have these sorts of thoughts. Like, But, yeah. of course, the difference between people who are having the thoughts and people who are coming to you or people who <laughs> these thoughts are taking yeah. over. Yeah. yeah. People who are coming to me, I think, um, are very obsessed with this mm -hmm. kind of thinking and they're really um, very afraid of letting it go. So, yeah, then there's the third group that describes the one we expect the most, I think, clients that have actually experienced a frightening or disturbing incident involving flying. So mm -hmm. they're in an emergency landing, have undergone severe turbulences or have had a relative die in a plane crash. As a result, those clients feel a degree of real threat emanating from aviation, which actually is not that common, this third group. The last category of fearful flyers, I would say, are clients who, which is much more common, displace deep fear or past trauma into an area that is easier to deal with, since they would not have to deal with it every day, like flying with an airplane. So a person who has experienced a life-threatening event in the past might repress the event, but then project the fear and the related emotions onto something that does not come up every day, that is not necessarily important, like flying. So the fear of trauma can stay contained and not being touched unless a client suddenly has the necessity to fly. So the trauma then sometimes emerges again on a flight when memories of being helpless but not able to flee the situation arise. In that case, the body memory of or the kinesthetic memory plays a key role since it can trigger past trauma. So the feeling of being trapped in a plane, not being able to exit the plane, experiencing it as a loss of control can cause a tremendous panic and a deep fear that needs to be dealt with. A lot of clients suffering from aviophobia lack a sense of self and a sense for their physical body and its needs. So they tend to breathe very shallow, hyperventilate silently, not loudly, but silently. You know, it's it's something that you wouldn't see in the plane. So if you go through the plane, you wouldn't see and notice who is afraid or who is not. Mm. Um, they tense their muscles or alter to complete immobilization. They sometimes even shut down and leave their sense of self behind. So what they do is they either focus on selective and increased perception of negative bodily sensations, like monitor each breath and each body movement, which then generally lead to panic attacks, or they disintegrate and shift to numbness and physical apathy. So people with aviophobia are extremely worried about their health, their safety, and are in the end terribly afraid of a crash, which is like the final thought that they would only be able to express when being in the seminar because there's the space to really talk about this kind of thinking. So what they do is they experience the deep-seated fear of dying. So this fear needs to be acknowledged and dealt with. And that's the common, that, that is common amongst all those categories of your clients? Yes, 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 I would say so. Even, even the people who are feeling uncomfortable when it comes to group sharing and when they we, we kind of collect um, their fears and their doubts and since when they're experiencing fear of flying, it always comes down to the plane crash. It always comes down to fear of dying in the end. And even if you talk about turbulences, if you talk about weather, about storms and everything like this, it's always, how does it affect the plane? Can it crash? So that's the deep fear um, that is underneath all this. Yeah, definitely. Mm. So people always try to avoid movement. 
it's crazy, but they look at the weather forecast, trying to foresee whether it might be a bumpy flight or not, instead of logically anticipating that the plane will definitely move in the air. They wouldn't doubt it if like, they could, would go on the ship that the ship is moving, but with an airplane, they expect it to be still and calm, which is not logically, of course. So it sometimes feels abstract and surreal to people if they are in a plane high up in the air, traveling over 500 miles an hour through invisible air, and then that horrible plane dares to move. <laughs> so what I do is I should try to prepare clients to the very likely possibility that the plane will move in one way or another, and that if they allow themselves to move along and let go of some of their muscle tensions, they might feel so much better and regain not only a sense of control over their body, but as well over the situation. That's so interesting. Thank you for pointing that out, that the, that the clientele could be anybody, and it's not just a certain population, but such and a wide range. Clients, when, when clients come to the seminars, they also expect, you know, people being there very disturbed or having a disease or in a disorder, mm -hmm. and they would call ahead and ask me, am I right in the seminar, and am I even a client? I just have fear of flying. And I'm like, yeah, you're totally right here. And everyone has just fear of flying. But then eventually, you know, other hidden issues come up and other fears are coming up. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here's the interesting part. Clients actually do not sign up for dance one therapy, but for a fear of flying seminar. People do not even anticipate therapy <laughs> work, but rather expect a one week and educational seminar to be the key in resolving all their fears at once. So this is like the huge challenge. Seminars work with systematic desensitization, which means a gradual confrontation with the object in the situation of fear. So it's not only step-by-step step on a cognitive level, but also allows a gradual introduction to movement, to the awareness of one's body and how one can change personal body sensations through movement. So this is the chance I got. And sometimes I've actually tried different approaches and found them not being helpful with flying. So they would come and you know not know what to do next. What I think is important to understand is there's really a great need of establishing trust not only into pilots through information, technology, and physics, but most of all in one's own well-functioning body. That, in my experience, is something they very much lack, the clients. They have lost this um, trust in their own body that it would function well. So throughout the seminar or individual sessions, I try to educate clients about physiology, about the auton autonomic um, nervous system, about normal body reactions in frightening situations. So what is the body doing when being afraid? So that they can gain an understanding of what has been going on with them when being in fear. You can call it psychoeducation or empowerment, since I'm also reminding clients of their own ability to understand and to alternate their own behavior in a threatening situation. In order to do so, it's imperative to not only educate on a theoretical level, but to gradually introduce clients to the awareness of their own body, to their capability of regulating their symptoms through movement. Throughout the sessions, clients learn to really notice their tension and to release that tension through movement. And it really, it's, it's interesting to observe because in the very beginning, they're rather, you know, hesitant with moving. Mm -hmm. uh, and throughout the seminar, it, it, it is, you know, it just comes, it flows, and I just look at them and they start to move. So what I do is I give them the opportunity to move every other moment during the seminar so that they gradually over the weekend or over the course of individual sessions do it themselves without a reminder or without me being the reminder by indirectly mirroring tension and releasing the tension through breathing and movement. So sometimes it's enough that I just, you know, inhale and exhale. And then they were like, oh, yeah, we think that's good. <laughs> Many clients who suffer from aviophobia don't have the ability to imagine moving even the tiniest bit in their seat while experiencing tremendous fear. And that's, I think, um, important to imagine that most of the clients are familiar with some sort of dance styles or movement exercises, but are not able to connect movement in their imagination to a situation that is terrifying for them while buckled up in a chair. In addition, most clients believe that the airplane is directly affected by every movement of the passengers, that it mm. cracks, people would move around too much inside of the cabin. So clients sometimes feel that something horrible would happen if they would let go of their fear, let go of their negative obsessive thoughts, or let go of their body tension, which 
gives them weird enough the sensation of control. Yeah. So generally, what also is a big issue, they're not comfortable to move in public in a non-movement setting. I mean, it's not a dance space, it's a plane. So everything, everyone is sitting quietly and maybe watching them. Accordingly, um, clients do not only really have to overcome their fear of flying, but also their fear of moving. And if they dare to move, first in the safe environment of the group and then together with the group, constantly supported and encouraged by an empathetic therapist, they generally feel so empowered that they also dare to fly. The minutes they start moving, they get an idea of how it feels like they have a tool at hand that is always ready to use, and the body starts to realize on its own what feels better, like being tense, not breathe, or move at all, or moving and breathing, get a little calmer step by step. So what I really observe is that they start moving and sometimes dancing during the seminar, giving up any hesitation since they now have an option. Now they can decide how they experience the situation and how they improve the situation by taking control of their body through dance and movement. You've really painted a nice picture about yeah, all sorry, this. Sorry, I'm going on and on. It's like... No, I, no, it's okay. I feel stressed, you know, <laughs> doing this work. And then again, I feel like so thrilled you know, being able to share it with people who know dance and movement and help, who know the power of dance and therapy because most of the therapists are not using this. And it's, it's a shame because movement is really a very great key in dealing with a fear in a confined space. So it's really yeah. helping. And movement <laughs> is the most primitive form of expression. So it makes so much sense, but somehow yes. we've lost that or have blocked that out of or inclusion of therapy or most things in life. So from what I'm hearing so far, it sounds like there's some education involved first. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain your, the process of these seminars? How do you use DMT to help clients work through flying phobias? Well, to describe it, it's, it's not very easy because it's basically a DMT session, whether it's in a room or in a therapeutic session, it doesn't matter. But what I do, the difference is that I try to transfer everything we do in session or in a group seminar onto the flight situation. So you need to prepare moving in seats while buckled up and while the plane is moving as well. Everything we do in sessions can assist in processing fear. But when thinking of moving in the air, I need to prepare in addition so that clients would know what they can expect. For instance, when moving in the room, dancing to some music, we transfer the dancing to our seats. So we would sit down and repeat movements that we have explored while being in the room so that everyone gets the chance to experience that it's possible to move in the seat. And that's what we also do um, the first day. We normally have an aircraft visit. So we would go on an aircraft that is standing still on the ground, not moving and not flying. And they can, you know, step by step gradually explore the cabin and even the cockpit and go in and out and then i have them for instance jump up and down or run the aisle or you know move in the seats we put up some music in the cabin first so that they can experience oh it's possible to move in the seat it's not that narrow it's not that confined the space and that's yeah it's it's really fun also <laughs> <laughs> How many dance therapy sessions are they engaging in before getting on the plane? When I work with individuals, it depends on the individual and their origin of fear and their individual situation. So this is difficult to answer, but if it's about a group, then it's a weekend. So it's a weekend seminar. It's a Saturday and a Sunday. The Saturday normally is like 10 hours or 11 hours. It's a long day. And what I do is I really implement movement throughout the entire seminar. So the main part is to transfer the moving, breathing, and dancing into the cabin, into the passenger seat while in the air, which is actually my favorite part of the seminar. <laughs> <laughs> movement is really implemented throughout the entire weekend in every part, every location, whether being in the room, visiting the aircraft for the first time, moving in the cabin without being in the air, then coming back to the room and reflecting on the experience in the evening with a small movement closure that we always do. And in the early morning, we do a Mary Chase circle. Everyone gets the chance to explore movement, to do an individual movement they like to try out and share it with the group. So every individual can experience movement as a tool to let go of the tension, to discharge at first. 
then gradually by letting them move on, going into space with their individual movements, then coming back into the circle, into the group, they can recuperate, reflect on how they gradually reconnected to mind and body. So I help them reflecting and monitoring, observing, being aware of what they did and what they are doing. Also, how they maybe transform negative feelings into positive calmness by moving, or how they regain control of their body and develop a feeling of strength and hope. So we work with movement, with various breathing techniques, with relaxation exercises, imagination. For example, imagining you are in your happy place, how that feels like. I would invite them to anchor the feeling with a small movement in their hand, for instance, mm-hmm. that can be repeated and therefore reminds them of their happy place whenever needed. So I really implement movement in all little details, in all little moments. For instance, when we work gradually towards fear of flying, we first would attempt to claustrophobia because this is very common and um, those clients. And we would, for instance, I would invite them to stand up and gather in a circle. And then I would tell them, okay, let's um, imagine that we're in a subway and we're standing in the subway and people are coming from outside and squeezing in. It's New York subway, of course. (laughs) They would squeeze in and squeeze in and squeeze in and you're holding tight and um, you're building up tension. You're standing there in the circle and you can't breathe anymore and you feel claustrophobic. So I would have them gather in the room in a circle. I mean, people who barely know themselves and then, you know, squeeze in and hold tight and imagine that they're in the subway and then ask themselves, are you still breathing? Mm. Um, what are you doing right now? Are you holding your breath? So I invite them to start breathe again, to let go of their arms, you know, with the risk of touching someone else, to look around, to look in someone's eyes, to notice that they're holding tension in their, in their belly and letting it go, to really dare to move a little tiny bit in their feet, in their knees, letting go of the tension in the stomach, in the chest, standing, but still standing in this confined space of the circle of, it's not a circle, but it's more like a bubble altogether. They would start to smile. They would start to even laugh because they realize, wow, it's up to me. I can control the situation by letting go of my tension, by starting to breathe again and allowing to inhale and exhale without this fear of, you know, someone coming too close to me. In the end of the therapeutic work in the seminar space, before we go to the airport, we do another circle of affirmation. Um, moving a little bit and saying out loud, for instance, yes, we can. I like that a lot. So movement continues, even when walking to the airport, at the gate, everywhere where we are, I would remind them. I would constantly, you know, remind them of breathing, moving, mirroring it myself, or gently suggesting it on a verbal level, like, are you breathing? Or let's move again. So what I then do when we come to the to the airport and go through security, being at the gate, waiting for boarding, we normally try to do a pre-boarding. So we would go on the plane before the other passengers. So we would have a chance to arrive, sit down, and then move again. So it's still about moving, and we still move. And then for the starting procedure, when the plane is speeding up, we prepare beforehand in the room a small exercise. So everyone is invited to do a group movement that we have worked out before. The tricky thing is to hold on to the tension a little bit and not too much so that they wouldn't go back to their old pattern of you know being in this tensed body. So I would you know suggest to fold up their arms, breathe in and out, and then letting go of all the tension and transferring it into movement the second the plane leaves the ground. And that's the cue. So normally people are used to being quite relaxed. And the second the plane leaves the ground or speeds up, they would tense up. And I would describe that beforehand. I would prepare them um, by being transparent in, you know, telling them that this is what they need to do in order to, you know, have a sense of control. That's generally a completely new experience for most of the clients, to move with the plane and then stay in movement, stay in the cabin, breathe in and out, move a little more, maybe dancing. So um, sometimes a row might even dance and do bigger movements in their seats, and sometimes they laugh and sing along, <laughs> or someone has an iPod and, you know, puts on some music. So um, every other passenger once in a while, you know, join us. 
And if allowed by the crew, depending on whether, of course, they get up from their seat. And I invite them to get up, stand, to get you know a sense of alignment, of standing on their feet, and then maybe move in the aisle or even dance. I even mm -hmm. once had a couple, it was really sweet, an older um, couple in a seminar who were trained in um, tango. So they danced some small tango steps together through the aisle. So it was really amazing <laughs> when they... <laughs> get got up and really were dancing. Yeah, I was thinking it sounds like you're bringing them to the present moment, not just yes. in their bodies, but also within the social interactions and just yes. being there in relationship with others versus being in their minds and in their, their fears. Yes, yes. And they really experience it throughout the seminar or sessions with me, depending on whether it is a group or individual session, they experience that this is something that they have access to, easily access to, the more they train it, to go into movement rather than going into shutdown or go into movement rather than going into too much tension. And they, you know, they gather this feeling of, oh, this feels nicer and my body responds more easily. And so it becomes more like a routine, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and was, according to Stephen Porges' polyvagal theory i don't know how familiar you are with it but oh, yeah. the, the social engagement is the the part that keeps us connected and mobilized without fear and so it sounds like that's part of yes. a big part of it too yeah and I also um, um relating to that theory of stephen forges i think i i don't know a lot about it but a little i think that bridging in the sympathetic nervous system um, from being shut down, from being paralyzed, from being in, in the sympathetic, very aroused to coming to a calmness or peace or being at rest is so difficult. But if you bridge it with mm. movement, then it's it, in, in a way easier path. And that's what my experience is why I think movement is the valuable tool, especially in flying phobias, because they only know the extremes. They know either sitting in the seat and not moving at all or, well, shut down. <laughs> right. Where, and, where's the um, middle ground? That their movement and that they can move sitting buckled up and that they can move a lot even. And that this helps them to come out of their fear is really tremendous. Yeah, that sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Th this sounds like such amazing work. And I'm curious about how effective it is in terms of how long do these effects last? Do you help the clients take home practices? How do they keep engaging in, in this therapy? Well, actually, the, the company that I work for that is in direct cooperation with the German Lufthansa, they um, evaluated, of course, the seminars for a long time. They had long, longitudinal studies. And what they found out is that 98, I think 98% of the people who would in the end of the seminar actually fly and have a positive experience would have that for a long time. So as long as they keep manifesting that positive experience, they can relate to it and they can still implement it. What is difficult is if they do the seminar, have a great experience, but then don't fly anymore. Mm -hmm. What? For whatever reason, sometimes they don't have the time or the money, and then they would, you know, call up two years later and, and they say, "Well, I had this great seminar, but I didn't have the chance to fly. So what can I do?" Since so several years now, we offer refreshers, so they would come to just one day of the seminar, um, connect to the group, and then have the experience of flying in the safe environment of the group, um, accompanied by the therapist. So this is, has been very helpful. They did an evaluation of um, all kinds of seminars that have been offered here in Germany, and our seminar really is as successful because what we do is we do this systematic desensitization step by step. They really can gradually, with their defense, not against their defense, you know, look at this object of fear and deal with their fear and process it in a, in a, in a good way. And we always say this is the first step. After one weekend, I mean, a weekend can solve all your fears, and some parts of fear are important, you know, to survive. 
So it's about differentiating between this part of fear that is too much and that is blocking my way and that is um, hindering me in exploring the world, traveling for work, for business, or whatever, or just for pleasure. In general, they really tend to experience it as positive. So experience, ha, huh, movement is helping me, ha. Huh. When I start to really recognize the sounds of the plane, the movements, when I can analyze what is happening, when I start to trust again, I can really implement movement. I can gain control, regain control, regain a sense of self. Why would I give up on that? You know? Mm, yeah. So, yeah, and I, I get a lot of postcards and emails and <laughs> I even meet a client in the plane. And it's very funny because when I enter the plane <laughs> and they sit there and they see me and they, oh, suddenly they start to move again. <laughs> <laughs> that was something. I have to move again. So this is really interesting. Yeah. Maybe they should carry around a picture of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You said that a huge part of your client population is people who are displacing their traumas into this contained fear of flying. Do you have any information or know at all if they, this is the first step of now actually starting to deal with their trauma and they now go home and kind of confront that? Or would it really be, is this the last step of confronting their trauma? Yeah, it's a, it's a huge question. It depends actually why people would sign up for a seminar, why they're coming, with what background they're coming, if they expect, you know, a trauma to be resolved, normally not. Normally they come, you know, having had a trauma or experienced a trauma, they might have experienced there, but that might have helped with a lot of issues, but not with the flying. So mm -hmm. in the end, they would come up with the seminar. Sometimes there are people who have experienced a trauma, haven't been aware of that it needs attention or it needs to be processed. And then they come to the seminar and then it suddenly comes up. Um, it gets triggered. Luckily enough, I'm a therapist, so I can <laughs> deal with that. But it's quite a challenge. And I try to, you know, the first thing and the most important thing with trauma is, I think, to acknowledge it and to give it a name. So just last weekend, I had a um, client who had a huge trauma in his past, and he was like, thank you for giving me a name. Thank you for putting words onto my experience and to acknowledge that this was indeed traumatic because other people would not acknowledge it. And it was more important for him to be acknowledged in having had a traumatic event in his past than doing the next step. And then when he started to notice that he could work on it gradually and that he was allowed to do it in his own time with his defense mechanism up, you know, not having to put his guard down or anything, that he was allowed to be himself, to go in his individual pace, that very much helped him to trust me and to go along with what I offered to him to try out some things. And um, actually, it turned out to be quite a dancer. It was funny because <laughs> I mean, when we were coming to the Marin Chase Circle, he was wildly doing movements and dancing around. And when we went on the plane, he was like, okay, I, I feel ready. I have acknowledged my trauma. Now I can let it go. I can leave it behind me. I know that I have to work on it. I know that I still have to process it. But I can say, this is my trauma and this is fine. This is two different things. And I can mm -hmm. separate it. I can do a first step by conquering the air and the plane and dealing with this. And then afterwards, I can still come back to dealing therapeutically with my trauma. And what I normally do is also recommend a therapist or they come to me and work subsequently with me on their trauma. So it's not only one week and that's it. I also tell them, you know, you might want to work on this a little longer and a little more. Hmm. So as you had said earlier in the interview, there are a lot of people who in some way can relate to this fear or maybe relate to something similar. So I was curious about how people can practice some of these techniques that you teach and facilitate. How can they practice that on their own? Well, for starters, you need to be aware of the individual patterns, like the breathing patterns when experiencing discomfort, stress, or fear either when just thinking of a fearful situation or actually being in it. I think it's important to really be aware 
where do I normally tend to hold tension? This is very individual. Some people are holding it in their chest, others in their shoulders, others in their stomach. So start to observe yourself, listen to your breathing. Maybe you're holding your breath or just breathing very shallow. Then you could start to breathe again, take a nice deep breath in and out. Start to slowly let go of your tension in the stomach, your chest, shoulders. Then you might want to try to loosen up a little more, gradually moving your limbs, hands and feet, maybe with a favorite song in mind or even music that you could put on an electronic device. You might even have a favorite song that you could listen to beforehand whenever you're relaxed and calm. So it could be conditioned, like in classical conditioning, in order to work for you when being in a fearful situation. So what we, you would do is you would choose like a song, a favorite song, and listen to it a lot of times when you're relaxed, and then you can try it out in a more tense situation. And what I normally do, I encourage clients when they are in individual sessions with me to bring um, one peaceful song, like a calm song, so that would help in relaxing and more a, a more um, active or vivid sa- song that would help them to go into movement or dance when really being tensed. The body could react to the music because it already learned that this song means to be calm and safe or to be vivid and alive. So it's not always about choreographed dance or dance steps, but it could be. So you either just start breathing and moving in your seat without music or you really choreograph a very simple combination of small movements to your favorite song, like a warm-up or a little routine, which of course doesn't have to be at all, you know, technically skilled or anything. You, you just move to it. So what I normally do is I invite people to bring the music. When I, for instance, had this 11-year-old girl I worked with for a year, she came and brought incredible music, pop music, and we really developed a routine together. So she taught the routine she (laughs) improvised movements and she was thrilled to you know try out movements while being seated in the seat in the room I was sitting down next to her so not in front of her so she can have her own space and so I would try to mirror her and she would you know start moving with along the song and then um, after like half year or so we invited her mom who wanted to go on a plane with her to come along so she would not only teach me her routine, but also teach her mother. So the task was her mother went on the plane with her, with that song, with that routine, to remind her of moving during the plane descent so that she really would you know, realize, oh, that's what I worked on and I can apply it here in the plane, which is amazing. And they did, and they <laughs> sent me a video of it, so it was wonderful. That's so great. Yeah. So you can use that and give yourself the opportunity to try it out when sitting on a train or finally when sitting on a plane. Um, It might surprise you that it's easier to move and dance than holding up the fear. That's always surprising for the people because they would feel it's easier to hold on to it than letting it go. Mm -hmm. That, of course, said in the assumption that all questions have been answered and all concerns have been attended to, that you have learned that flying is nothing to be afraid of and that it's always your own decision step by step, which I think is very important. I've once heard a sentence that I always tell my clients also in the end of the seminar. It says, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the decision that something is more important than fear. What people can start to do is differentiating between the present and the past, between the powerlessness and the power, the involuntary and the willing, the unconscious and the conscious, So one can transform from feeling to be a victim to a confident and active self. So courage or lust for life can emerge again. So it's not merely about using an airplane as a means of transportation, but rather about controlling the fear instead of being controlled by fear. So it's about living a normal life, about trusting oneself and others, and it's about autonomy of the body itself. I think as long as there's movement in the direction of progress, this mind-body relation can be revealed in its complexity so that people can be aware of it and be recreated piece by piece into a coherent whole of an autonomous self by using this most powerful tool of movement. And clients really report, you know, when sending postcards or emails, I moved, I danced, and I really am so glad that I could, you know, apply it in the plane. And 
sometimes people move along in the plane and it's it's not so much about being ashamed or what are other people thinking about me but they really have this experience that it helps and then they don't care anymore what other people think of them but they just move and dance and feel happy to do so hmm. yeah and i can imagine that you can apply the these techniques to a lot of different things that you're fearful about yes so that's yes really cool I have- I have one client who he's afraid of heights and also flying, of course. And he was coming to the seminar but didn't dare to fly with the group and asked me whether he could first work with me in therapy and then maybe eventually do the seminar once again. So I have him as a client for over a year now. And just a month ago is that he came late to sessions. <laughs> and I asked him, so what happened? Why are you late? And he was like, well, I was caught up by customs control. And I'm like, by what? And he said, well, I was, you know, we ha- we are living in Hamburg with a harbor mm-hmm. and there's a huge bridge that is really high and there um, is custom control because it's a harbor. So what he did is he went there because he thought, okay, now I'm trying it out before session and then I can tell my therapist that I did <sighs> on some music that we worked on and he was moving in the car and then he went for the bridge. So he crossed the bridge and he was feeling so thrilled that he went again and back and forth. So it was eight <laughs> times until custom control went up to him and, and was like, so what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Here? Suspicious. Yeah. That's funny. Wow. That's really yeah. great. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I started out this interview really wondering what is it that you do and how, and I feel like I've really come to understand or at least have a picture of what happens. So that was really helpful. Yeah, welcome to come to Germany and join us. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> that will be fun. <laughs> That's yeah. great. I'm so glad we got connected. And yes. Um, yes. this was so interesting and so intriguing. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun. It was great meeting you. It was great meeting you, too. Thank you so much for sharing your work. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Antonia. Thank you all for listening. And please don't forget to leave a rating if you're short on time. Leave a review. Send me some feedback by visiting my website, www.mindyourbodydmt.com. And or visiting my Facebook page for this podcast, search Mind Your Body, a dance movement therapy perspective. Okay, hope to hear from you. Bye.